conferences where we'll ask you to keep your phones turned on. Um, we're going to bring up the cell phone number you see there. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to encourage you to engage our uh, panel by sending in your questions via text. We have a team at the back that will take your text message, convert it into a, the questions, and list them out and supply them to Scott, who's facilitating, and he will have them on his screen. He will pick the most appropriate, the most compelling uh, um, questions that you've sent in. Last year, we had over 40 questions sent in. We fed them up to Scott, and he was able to use almost a dozen of them to prompt the speakers as they came up. So we really encourage you to, uh, to start that uh, interaction. Now, let me start by introducing you to um, a widely recognized expert and author in talent, Mr. Tom Casey. Tom is the managing principal of Discussion Partner Collaborative. Now, Discussion Partner Collaborative has over 200 consultants worldwide in 20 different locations, focused on executive advisory and to CEOs and divisional presidents on leadership effectiveness and human capital matters. Tom is the principal and co-founder of Next Generation Advisory which focuses on succession planning and pre-retirement transition coaching to enterprise executives. An expert in development of organizational transformation strategies for rapidly growing multinational or transitional organizations, Tom has consulted in over 20 countries and virtually every economic sector. Tom is the author of over 100 articles and three books, and his most recent book you've heard of a couple of times today, Talent Readiness, The Future is Now. It is also a bestseller. Tom is on the Executive Advisory Board for the Harvard Business Review, as well as the Human Capital Institute, where he is a featured speaker and writer. Tom is a Bachelor of Education degree from the University of Alaska. He also holds an MA and an MBA degrees from Riviera College. He's a graduate of Yale's Yale School of Management Executive Management Program. Tom is both a United States Air Force and a United States Army Special Operations veteran. He retired from the Army Reserve as a colonel. Tom presently maintains residence in both the United States and Peru. And please join me in welcoming Mr. Tom Casey. Okay, joining Tom, it is also a great pleasure to introduce to you a globally recognized es expert and author and a New York Times best-selling bestseller of *The Speed of Trust*. You've heard it several times this morning. The speed of trust is translated into 20 different languages. Mr. Covey brings to his sorry brings to his writings the perspective of a practitioner. He's the former CEO of Covey Leadership Center, which is under the which under his stewardship became the largest leadership and development company worldwide. He's a Harvard MBA graduate and the co-founder of the current of currently sorry the, and runs the Franklin Covey's global speed of trust practice as you know we've spoken of him many times this morning a global expert in trust mr stephen m r covey please Okay, the next person I'd like to introduce you to, again, it is an absolute honor to reintroduce and welcome back um, our expert in education and training and aviation professionalism, Dr. Tony Kern. Tony is the CEO of Convergent Performance, a small veteran-owned think tank formed in 2004 and dedicated to reducing human error and improving human performance in high-risk environments such as aviation or military, healthcare, and firefighting. Tony is one of, the most, one of the world's leading authorities in human performance, has lectured on the subject of applied human factors and performance improvement in nearly, for nearly two decades, and is the author of several books on the subject. His newest book, Going Pro, The Deliberate Practice of Professionalism, Tony has created a 21st century guide to extreme professionalism for the individuals and organizations that want to reach a level three professionalism in their environment. Tony has a deep operational, uh, deep operational roots as well. He was a commanding pilot, uh, sorry, a command pilot and flight examiner in the B-1B bomber, as well as being in sta senior staff leadership roles. 
He holds a master's degree in public administration and military history, as well as a doctorate degree in higher education specializing in human factors training. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tony Kern. And finally, a man that I think uh, you all know and back with overwhelming demand, an expert in human factors, aviation safety, as well as an author of Human Factors Analysis and Classification System and HFACS, um, a friend of the summit. He's participated with us for the last seven years. Scott Chappelle is currently a professor at the Industrial Engineering Department in Clemson University. He has 20 years in the military, 11 in active duty as the aerospace experimental psychologist. He has published or presented well over 200 papers, books, and presentations in the field of accident investigation, safety system, behavioral stressors, sustained operations, and fatigue. Dr. Chappelle holds a degree in psychology and a PhD in neuroscience. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Scott Chappelle. So Scott, I will turn it over to you and we can watch the fun begin. <laughs> Gentlemen. Well, it's always hard to come up with the uh, first question, but I will tell you that they made me take my tie off to get more comfortable up here. I would encourage you to do the same if you'd like to do that. Um, but uh, I'm going to start with actually a family problem. And uh, I have two daughters and they're both very, very different. And one is kind of that born leader my youngest, who uh, my 14-year-old going on 21, and my oldest one isn't. And the question I have really for the panel, and I don't know who would like to take this question first, is really, is there a leadership gene? Because it seems to me since day one, my youngest daughter has been the, the leader and my oldest daughter has been the follower. And if there is such a gene, then why are we wasting all of our money on leadership training? So I'll throw that out to the panel. Let's see who wants to bite. <laughs> I'll, I'll bite. Uh, I don't know if there's a gene, because if there is, we would really legalize cloning. But the, the, I don't think that you can look at it, because to be honest with you, there's some people who appear to be born leaders, and then they take it for granted. And then there's some people who pattern leadership behaviors and are more successful. I think that what we're seeing right now, particularly right now, and talking to the other members of the panel, leadership is more about accountability than it is skill. And it is much more in terms of trying to do the right things right and be a model for good behavior regardless of what is or isn't innate. Guys? Yeah, I'll, I'll take this because first of all, <clears throat> Scott, I think this is a trick question. With the only guy up here <laughs> with a PhD in neuropsychology asking us about genetics, I, I can already see where this, this morning is going. Um, I don't know if there's a leadership gene, I missed it. Um, I have, uh, I've been, in leadership positions for quite a while, military, uh, went through the US government uh, senior executive service program and as a small business leader for, for the last nine years. I think, um, I think it's experiential. I, I think it's important you get the right lessons. I guess the one, the one leadership lesson that, uh, that might be genetic that, that came down from my father is um, learning how to be miserable and still go to work. I mean, seriously, I mean, leadership to me is uh, not an elegant ballet. It's, uh, it's more like um, the Iditarod. It's, it's in a hostile environment, day in and day out, problem solving and, and getting back to work. And I think, uh, you know, if that's part of the genetic makeup, then, then maybe that's the part I caught. You know, it kind of reminds me of uh, what Peter Drucker said about effectiveness, because he was asking to teach effectiveness. And he said, well, you know, effectiveness can't necessarily be taught, but because it's a discipline, it can be learned. And I think a very similar thing might be said about leadership, is that you might argue about how it can be taught or not and, and have some respectful argument about that, but I think there is no argument around the idea that it can be learned. And there's... there's dimensions of it, there's competencies that are part of leadership, and there's character. So the combination of the character and the competence helps us build leadership. And I think that that is something that we can learn and get better at and improve at, and that's hopeful. I also would say this, that, that uh, leadership is a choice. 
not just a position. See, most people operate from the premise that it's a certain manager, a certain level of position in the organization. Those are the leaders. And, and, uh, but the bigger idea really is the notion that leadership is a choice, not a position. So at any level of the organization, someone can be a leader for his or herself, for their lives, for their team, for their organization. And yes, it's nice when you see people at the top also behaving, acting as a leader in creating vision and inspiring and unleashing talent. But even right at the bottom of an organization or in the sides or wherever it might be, leadership still is possible. It's a choice that people can make where they demonstrate the character and the competence. So I think that this is something that we can learn and get better. Whether there's an actual gene or not, I don't know, but I know we can improve in the function and the process of leadership. Yeah, I mean, I, it seems to me, because I, I, I hear exactly what all three of you are saying, I, I tend to agree. It's been a struggle of mine because I've seen students come through that I've trained that some are just natural born leaders and it's not something I can teach somebody. I've never been able to effectively teach leadership, but you can develop it. And so that's one of those things. But one of the pillars, as I recall in my, my Navy days, no offense to the Air Force and Army guys, uh, we'll get there later, but uh, your training must be a little bit different. But uh, I, I just remember them engendering this idea of trust and trust in people. And again, it's another one of those things where I'm not sure how you go about teaching trust or ensuring that trust is out there. And how do you engender trust in, and I, obviously we're in an aviation environment here, but without trust, you've got a big problem. And how do, you, how do you burn trust and how do you earn trust? It's kind of one of those million dollar questions that I used to ask all of the people as they were coming up the ranks. How do you burn trust and how do you earn trust? Because if you don't know, so I guess my question to you guys is, how do you burn trust and earn trust, and how do, you, how do you select somebody for a leadership position of that nature? I'll take it since it's a trust question. <laughs> I mean, it's right in your wheel, <laughs> so. Yeah, uh, great, great questions around this, and people are asking all the time, how can you trust someone? How do you give them trust? Do they earn it? What, what have you? Well, here's a basic premise. Trust is a function of two things. It's a function of your credibility and of your behavior. Credibility and behavior. And if you focus on it this way, you can see kind of how trust is gained and how it is lost. But where it starts is with yourself. So it takes, it's really a process of looking into the mirror and asking the question, do I trust myself? And then do I give to others a person they can trust? See, that self-trust is where you begin. And that it, with your own credibility, your personal credibility. You can do the same thing for a team. You can say, how credible is our team? And look at the credibility of the team. Does the team trust themselves? Do they give to their partners, to those that they serve, a team that they can trust? And so forth with an organization. But it's always an inside-out process, starting with yourself, looking into the mirror. When I flew up here yesterday, um, I got on the, the plane and I heard the stewardess say, you know, if we lose pressure, oxygen mask will come down. Put your own mask on first, then help those around you. And that's kind of what trust is about, is you put your own mask on first. You start with yourself, and then you're more clearly able to see and help others grow trust in them too. So that's that credibility. That's the starting point, credibility, believability. But then on top of the credibility is our behavior. By behavior, I mean what we do and how we do it. Do we behave in ways that grow trust? And there's a, hundreds of behaviors, but there's certain behaviors that are extraordinarily high leverage at building trust. I'll give you a couple of examples. One is to talk straight, tell the truth, call things what they are, instead of spinning and twisting and manipulating. If someone gets the reputation of being a straight talker, telling the truth, you can trust that person. But if someone gets the reputation of spinning everything, and any, any time they speak, you discount, you dilute, you tax what they say. You can't quite trust them. Another such behavior is to keep commitments. You make a commitment, you keep it. You make another commitment, you keep it. Very simple, common sense stuff. And yet too often people overpromise and underdeliver. But as a result, others aren't quite sure if they can trust them. But when you do what you say you're gonna do, you build the trust. 
And finally, I'll may maybe mention a third behavior that really helps build trust, is to give it, to extend it. It's kind of ironic that one of the best ways to create trust is simply to give it. But I'll tell you why. It's because trust is reciprocal. And when we give it, people receive it, and they return it. When we withhold it, they withhold it. One reason why in many organizations the employees don't trust their management is because the management doesn't trust the employees, and the employees reciprocate the distrust right back, and so forth. But it works the positive direction too. When you give it, people receive it, they return it. So that would be kind of a, a starting point on trust. Start with yourself, look into the mirror, your own credibility, or your team's credibility, and then focus on your behavior. Make sure you behave in ways that grow trust, because in doing that, you'll earn it, and you'll avoid losing it, burning it, when you avoid the behaviors that break it, like violating a commitment. That will destroy trust, and uh, especially if it's a significant commitment. So it's a function of credibility and behavior, from my perspective. Tom, go ahead. Yeah, I think that there's also a generational aspect to this that you need to keep in mind, which is that by the time people are working for you, they've already had some patterns in terms of whether they've become trusting or not trusting. And that's frankly the world around them. There was a study done of baby boomers in the United States, of which I'm one, back in the 70s, and 60% of us said that we would have been better off without parents. <laughs> I'm not sure how we would have gotten here, but yeah, the theory was that the parents, had cre our parents, had created these institutions, whether it was the Vietnam War or the resignations of our presidents, that we didn't think they were deserving of trust. So it had been violated around the time we came into the workforce. Alternatively, you've got the Generation Y. Those of you who are parents of this generation, you are their heroes. They trust you. To Stephen's point, they, it is implicit trust, which you can only lose as a parent, but it, reluctantly so. When these folks, young men and women, are getting into the workforce, they are looking at you, and it's, you are a franchise. To Stephen's point, it can only go up or down based on how you behave. But this group of people is much more willing than my generation was to concede the trust to start. Go ahead, Tony. Yeah, let, let, me, get, let me address this with, a, with about three vignettes, and I'll, I'll keep them brief. But um, I think exactly what these gentlemen are saying is, is true. It's just in my personal experience, it hasn't happened that way. Um, I came up, I'm a blatantly average aviator. If you were supposed, whoever the experts are that design training programs had me in mind, I'm a C student. If you're supposed to get it right on the fifth sortie, then by God, it was late in the fifth sortie when I learned how to land a no flap. You know, that was, that was my, I was predictably progressive. I had to work hard to stay on the line. So somewhere in the middle of my uh, United States Air Force career, they got my records confused with a qualified guy, and I became selected to fly the B-1 bomber, brand new off the, uh, off the plant floor. Uh, and I engaged just like I did everything else, hard work, study, chair flying, trusted my instructors, uh, worked them hard, and, uh, and I became qualified to fly that airplane. And then something weird happened. I went to my base, and I went and looked at the schedule, and I was all there to fly it by myself. There was nobody sitting in the other seat to help me. And I said, my god, they've made this huge mistake. <laughs> they, I, they can't possibly trust me by myself to go out and fly this uh, $300 million airplane and be responsible for the lives of these, these people, let alone you know, the, the, the military mission of that. I said, there must be some mistake. And so that's vignette one that I, even though, and it's a tie to training, because even though the, the system was built to promote trust through training, I finished it and still had this huge hole of self-doubt. Fast forward seven months later, um, now I'm in control of everything. You know how pilots are, ah, this is easy. Um, I got 370 hours in the airplane, so I've got everything figured out. And I'm flying back to McConnell Air Force Base in Wichita, Kansas. And we come up out of a low level route, which is 540 knots, 200 feet off the ground, kind of like what you guys do, only on fast forward. Um, nap of the earth stuff. And come up, and now it's relax time. And we, we check the, all the checklist. And, and the center of gravity, and the, which is really important in the B1 because it's designed around a neutral stability concept to, make it more fuel efficient and radar cross signature and everything. But it's really important that your target center of gravity is your actual center of gravity in this airplane. Very, very important. And it moves fuel back and forth 
down forward tanks, back tanks to, to make that happen. Well, it wasn't. It was forward of the target. And I had never seen it before. My co-pilot had never seen it before. The guys in back had never seen it before. We quickly got on the radio and started asking. No one had ever seen it. Well, you must have done something wrong. Well, as this discussion's going on, the airplane is getting heavier and heavier and heavier in my hand. So good pilot just trims off all the pressure, right, until the trim is fully run back, and the airplane remains getting heavier. I have an uncontrolled fuel transfer to the front of the airplane, and I'm about to lose control of the aircraft, all in about three and a half minutes from ops normal. So I turned to my co-pilot, a gentleman named Jack Keitel, and I said, find me a piece of concrete. We were right over liberal Kansas, so we got the wings forward, spiraled down, landed, um, and of course, when we call it in, the maintenance guys come out, could not duplicate, right? You must have screwed something up, right? <laughs> they, they, uh, we, we fly the aircraft back, functions perfectly, land it, and I walk in, and here's the real point of the story. As I'm walking into my commander's office, which because I know he's gonna wanna speak to me, this B-1 was a political <laughs> hot potato back then, um, I can hear him on the phone, and I stop like you normally do. I knock on the door, stand at attention. I'm about to say, Sir Captain Kern requests permission to enter. And he just waves me in and puts me, says, sit down, be quiet. And he's going, hell yes, he did it. Yes, that crew ran every procedure. Now, yes, of course they pushed the, the auto override switch. Yes, they tried transferring this. I, I know it. Listen, everything that you've just told me that crew did, they briefed me last night. All right, thanks. I don't want to hear any more about this. Click, he hangs up. He's talking to his commander. Now that, I said, were you talking about me? <laughs> because if you were, I'm not sure that, that really happened. You know? And he said, listen, and this is important. I trust your training. You were the man on the spot. You made the decisions. You got the airplane down safely. You brought it back safely. Everybody's home safely. He said, now you have to trust me. You have to, if anybody asks you these things, I'm not asking you to lie, but I'm asking you not to, to get in the way of me being a, a leader here. So I tell you those vignettes because I think sometimes these things don't fit together like nicely formed Lego blocks or jigsaw puzzles. Sometimes they're clunky, but they're earned in that process. And then the last thing I'll tell you when I flew the, uh, the regional jet up here, I look, every time I get in a cockpit and I see a 12-year-old in the seat, <laughs> I trust them because I trust the training and I trust their leadership. So. That, that's a good point. Actually, there's, a, there's an interesting question from the audience uh, because I think this is true. I think sometimes the, the question from the audience is how do you build trust when the budget gets in the way? And a lot of times as leaders, you're faced with making a decision based on the budget or a bigger picture that isn't transferred to the people that are working for you. So how do you answer that question? How do you build trust when the budget gets in the way? I would have to say there has to be an element of transparency there. All right? You can't pretend that there's no, if the budget is unlimited. You can't pretend that you have unlimited resources, et cetera. And I think that one of the cornerstones of trust, at least in the, in the, the type of work that I do, and Stephen can speak to this obviously as well, is if you're honest and transparent and consistent about it, not saying one honest thing and then being disingenuous and something else, that people will understand and appreciate circumstances. It's when you pretend the circumstances don't exist and or you portray them in much rosier than they actually are, then you get it and it, it get jammed up. Steve? Yeah, I would echo uh, what Tom just said about transparency, especially the need to declare your intent. Let people know what you're doing and why, especially the why behind the what. Too often we declare the what and not enough of the why. But the why, declaring our intent, really can help us be transparent. So rather than having a hidden agenda, we have an open agenda. Nothing to hide. We're transparent. And if there's budget issues and challenges, you, you acknowledge it, you, you, you declare it. You're not trying to spin it, you're just acknowledging it. But one of the key learnings is this, that it's how you do what you do that makes all the difference. I've seen companies that even have had to downsize, and yet they're focusing on building trust. And someone from the outside said, how can we possibly build trust when we're downsizing? 
We're laying people off. How can you build trust doing that? But you see, they went about it in such a way that they, at the end of the day, they actually engendered trust. They declared their intent. They acknowledged their reality. See, one of the behaviors that builds trust is to confront reality. If there's a reality out there and you're burying your head in the sand, acting like it's not there, hoping it goes away, rather than building trust, that will destroy trust, especially among those that are kind of aware and savvy. That you're not confronting the real issues. So you confront the reality. And then you're transparent about it. You declare your intent. Here's what we're doing. Here's why we're doing it. Here's our end in mind. Here's our agenda on this. And then they went about it, in this case, they went about it with great respect. They, they listened to people. They involved people in the problem. They worked out the solutions together. And the bottom line was they still had to downsize. And they did it. But they showed great respect for people in the process. They were transparent. They talked straight. And the net effect was they came out the backside. So, see, the budget was lacking. They had to cut down on the budget. And yet they came out with higher trust. How? By, by the way in which they did it, the manner in which they behaved, how they did, what they did, made all the difference. And, and so that's something that we can choose to do otherwise, even when we have constraints all around us, because we usually do have constraints. So the more transparent you can be about it, the more you can still talk straight about it and declare your intent, involve people in the problem, you can still navigate this in a way that grows trust. Now, none of that is easy, and sometimes it doesn't always work that way. I agree with Tony's point. It's usually messy in real life. And in this case, I'm thinking right now of uh, what Tony Shea did of Zappos.com, where they had to downsize, and he did it, came out with higher trust than before. And, and uh, because he did it with such transparency and demonstrated such intent towards his people and listened and was respectful, that he ended up with higher trust. So it's possible. It's not easy to do that, but it's often possible. Yeah, I, I think I'd like to make one point on that. And I, and I believe lean times are, are actually maybe the best times, at least in small businesses, to build trust. Because, I mean, you're right there with who you are, with the resources at hand, uh, with the problem in front of you. And, uh, and in so many cases, we'll say, well, we'll, we'll, we'll bring in a consultant. We'll, we'll get some technology support or we'll hire a couple of contractors to augment our technical writing staff or whatever. But lean times doesn't allow you those, don't, don't allow you those opportunities. So you sit down and you confront things, I think, in a more, uh, with the event horizon, the time horizon so much shorter, there's not a small businessman in this room who doesn't, in the back of his mind somewhere, have a time to die meter on the bank accounts. I know it. I, I live it every day. And so when you've got that, and, and like you said, as a common point of reference, you know, you're not creating an emergency necessarily, but you are definitely creating a sense of uh, an actionable, learnable moment around a, a near-term challenge. I think it's the very best time for people to show, you know, NASA has a phrase, they say, the stars shine bright in the darkness. And that's mm -hmm. where you see people be able to come forward and bring their uh, skills to the game. Go ahead. Yeah. What makes this a great question is it puts it in the context of economics. And one of the things, and it goes along the lines of the transparency and immediacy, is what happens when a CEO or a senior leader starts tr having trust problems in their own judgment? And that's actually one of the things that's fascinating right now, is one of the areas that in our consultancy we get questions from the CEOs. They want us to evaluate as to whether or not they're the right person in the context of where the enterprise is at the time. And we have to share with you, over 70% of the time, we come back and we say, no, you're not. <laughs> OK? But they Remind knew, me not to hire you they, guys. <laughs> <laughs> note, note to Tony. J jury's already in on that one, Tony. But uh, <laughs> what's happening is they started to have reservations long before they asked the question, because the circumstance changed. And this goes back to something that Stephen said, is if you can't role model what it is to be an, a leader that's deserving of trust. If you have some reservations about that yourself, it's best to call the question a lot earlier because it ultimately will be called on you and obviously not with great outcomes. It's interesting you mentioned that because, and, and I, I listened to what Stephen said about looking at yourself in the mirror. And about two weeks ago, I looked at myself in the mirror and when I, I used to have this, well, I had a little uh, fur here, but it was all white. And I was, I was old. And I, I turned 50 this year, and it was very dramatic because I remember when my parents turned 50, I thought they were going to die the next day. <laughs> and, and so I realized that I'm now one of the guys I used to make fun of, you know, the balding fat guy that, you know, stays in the bar too much. 
And, and so I had evolved into my father and my grandfather, which was scary. So, and I'm looking around the workforce. You look around this room, and actually there's a question on this with regard to Generation X, and there are like four different generations in here. And I'm, I'm quickly, I'm not the oldest generation. I'm now, what used to be the oldest generation was our generation. Now we're not. The workforce is loaded with people. That, how, do you, how do you manage that? when we're gonna have an older workforce that's not moving on, and that you're a leader and you maybe should be leaving, and I can't relate to the younger folks. My kids, I have no clue what my 14-year-old does. She comes down in the craziest outfits that, you know, as a father, you really don't wanna look at. And, and so, how do you deal with people with regard to tr all these topics we're talking about? I, I think you need to appreciate it. I, I vividly remember the weekend I turned 60. My wife flew up from Peru, spent a nice weekend together. She flew home, and I'm sitting there watching the Super Bowl with a computer in my lap, thinking, Jesus, you're 60. How the hell did that happen? <laughs> you know, you kind of missed the memo on this. And then the halftime show in the Super Bowl was the who. And I'm thinking, <laughs> well, hell, they're older than I am. You can't be that <laughs> You know, when you get into the generations issue here, you know, you got, it's a great time to be old folks. All right, and this is one of the things, and the, the data's backing this up, the conversations Tony, Stephen, and I have been having about where are we going to get the people to do the work in the years ahead? In the United States, just as an example, the two fastest growing segments of the workforce, first one is over the age of 55, and the second fastest is over the age of 65. So to your question, Scott, the issue here is you need to challenge the assumptions about age. I don't think that anybody in their right mind would hire a 55-year-old to put them on the fast track, all right? because that would be counterintuitive the way we think about age. But trust me on this. You will have to do that soon. It is inevitable, because we're going to need to continue to do the work. 50 in the States, baby boomers, 87 million born. Generation X, the future leadership, 44 million. All right, there is a disconnect there that is inevitable. You want to share the airline story? Um, well, uh, there is a major airline uh, but that, that is facing what, as an industry, we are all facing. Uh, the, we have in aviation, and I'm primarily expertise on fixed wings, so I'm not sure exactly where the rotary wing world is on this, but we currently have the most mature experienced workforce that has ever existed in history and will ever exist in history. And that workforce is going to change over in huge numbers over the next four to eight years. And let me give you the three reasons why that happened. First of all, you need to understand that primarily the major employers of fixed wing pilots are whom? Airlines, right? And how do they promote? Seniority, you get a line number and if Scott's number one and I'm number two and we can only afford one guy, it doesn't matter if I am so much more superior to him, which is obvious on the stage, he's gonna keep his job, right? <laughs> and I did wanna mention, Scott, by the way, welcome to the, welcome to the Let's Make Fun of Scott Chappelle Club. There's a large number of us. And <laughs> you're welcome to join us at the bar this afternoon. But so, so it's all seniority based for the most part and Three things happened. The first thing was 9-11. Huge blow to the airline industry, huge blow to the economy. And as a result of that, uh, about 20, 25% of major airline pilots were furloughed. They said, hey, go hang out for a while. When the economy recovers, we'll call you back. Then comes 2004, 2005, fuel prices, all of the issues surrounding the beginning of the recession. Those guys don't get called back. In fact, another 15% get chopped. Right. Go a little bit further on, and uh, President Obama in the United States last year signed the age 65 rule, so you could fly from age 60 to age 65, and we have set in place a huge demographic of, I'd love to say wisdom, but I won't. I'll just say gray hair for now. It could be wisdom, and it's important that it becomes wisdom before that next generation comes in. But, but to top point, the, the, the stage is set for probably the most massive generational handoff of, of culture in the history of any industry. And, and I'm dangerously close to your turf, so I'll, I'll stop there. 
Yeah, I, I just, I look at this and I think about the, because I'm dealing with this I, I, as I'm trying to deal with kids in college that are very young, and the work ethic is different. Um, I'll tell you that straight up. I, I, I've never seen such a group of people come up that challenge authority. I mean, I didn't grow up in the 60s, but they challenge authority on everything. And, and, and the university is a microchasm of society, and, I, and the old people don't like to be challenged. And I, I, it's an unusual situation to be in. Yeah. But I, I think that if you think of the generations, it's, there's two things to consider. One is when they challenge, they challenge respectfully unless you've betrayed their trust. And that's a good then point. They, then they're very confrontational. But the other thing is you need to think about their acculturation, their assimilation, social media. I have to believe that life is something you do between texts when you're looking at some of these folks, okay? And the, you take it down to the next generation, the 13, I have a 13-year-old niece who won a um, uh, softball tournament. And I, her, her father calls me, I said, well, send me her email so I congratulate her. He said, she's not on email, it's old technology. It's all Facebook. <laughs> And that afternoon, I drive in, and there's my 10-year-old granddaughter looking at her notebook, complaining that it's too slow. And my 8-year-old granddaughter is looking at her iPhone, checking the weather. So this is an issue here where it's an, an issue not necessarily about authority or lack thereof, or respect or lack thereof. It's an appreciation of how they grew up and how substantively different the formative years are than the hours were. And, and circling right back to Stephen's point, it is an issue of trust. In fact, I might comment. Um, there's research out that shows that people that routinely use the internet as part of how they operate trust more than those who don't. People that use Facebook trust even at an even higher rate than those who don't. And because of the nature of the social media interactions, and, and so this is part of the generation. It's in the DNA. It's in the, in the who they are, how they think. And it plays out into the workforce in a variety of different ways. I'll give you one illustration. Um, uh, Bestbuy.com, the online store for Best Buy, the retailer. So here they are, an online store. And they got a bunch of younger workers. These are mostly Gen Y and millennials that were working there for the servicing the, the orders that were taking place. And they were saying, you know what, why, why, why do we have to come into this call center and be all here together to do this order, uh, to, you know, to process these orders? We have technology that can help us do this. And they were asking for more trust. They basically said, let us, let us work where we want and when we want as long as we're doing the job well and on time. In other words, hold us accountable. And they were not saying lower the standards. They were just saying trust us. Let's use technology as a tool. Well, they were, the, the leaders were a little bit careful and cautious because no one wanted to give out a blind trust. They didn't want this to turn south on them. But they decided that this could be smart, that this could be a smart trust. And so they said, okay, we will. We'll trust you to work where you want and when you want, but here's the expectations, here's the standards to be done well on time against these standards. And they, and they went this, down this path. Well, what was remarkable was within a very short period of time, of this transition from the central kind of call center to work where you want, when you want, they saw a dramatic increase in productivity. The productivity went up 35%. Wow. Same people, same customer, same business, 35% increase. Why? Well, people responded to, be, to being trusted. They, this, was in, this was who they were, this was what they wanted. They wanted to prove them, they wanted to be given the trust, but they also wanted to prove that the trust was justified. And they, they rose to the occasion, they performed better, they brought out the best in them, they returned the trust, and they got better results. So having some awareness of, of uh, the generations and what interests them, you know, most everyone wants to be trusted, but there's some folks in particular that really want to have a chance to be given that trust and sometimes they think that they need to be given it, not just earn it, and then they'll show you that they deserve it when they get it. But it affects how we lead, how we manage in a whole variety of ways. Well, you guys are doing something, because I'm getting jammed. I just Scott, get my questions out. Scott, before you go to that, I, I, <laughs> since these guys brought up social media, and since we're dealing with trust, I, th I think it's a, a 
point in time to say that comes with a bit of sophistication. The, when it comes to professional image, one of the, the, the six elements of professionalism in my new book, by the way, I hate it when people are on stage and push their new book, but there's a hundred of them out there for sale. Uh, <laughs> um, but my favorite chapter in writing that book was a chapter called Fired on Facebook. And we need to let people know, we need to let that eight-year-old and 10-year-old and 12-year-old and, and 22-year-old know that people are watching, people are reading. And uh, the, the classic example, the one that's kind of uh, now become the iconic representation of, of having a little sophistication of what you put online is uh, a lady, and I won't tell you where she's, where she's from or what company or anything, but she came home from work, got on Facebook around six o'clock, which leads me to believe she probably stopped for one or two drinks with her friends on the way home, got on and said, my boss is such a pervy wanker. All he does is make me do the SHIT jobs. I hate it, I hate my job. And 45 minutes later, the boss responded, maybe you forgot two things, that you had friended me on Facebook a couple of months ago and that you have three weeks left in your probationary status. Don't bother to come in. I'll stick your termination notice in the post. And yes, I am serious. Very, very interesting. I don't know about the rest of you out there, but if I have a, um, an employment um, prospect candidate in my hands, I am checking every social media site I possibly can before I bring them into interview. So a little bit of sophistication with how we use that social media, I think is important. I, I've got to throw this one at you guys, because it's, and whoever it is that came up with this, I'm going to steal it just so you know, um, for my next book, uh, because I love this. Age is mandatory, maturity is optional. <laughs> I'm sure some other people have said, who, who put that question out there? <laughs> Anybody going to take, there you go, I love that. So guys, age is, age, age is mandatory, maturity is optional. What do you do with that? Well, you don't touch it, so I'll give it to Tony. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take it first, uh, and, I'll, and I'll be very brief, and, and I will bring it back to you. Which one are you, both, or uh, mature? Uh, <laughs> I don't have my glasses on, I'm going to pass comment. Um, well, I, I, I think um, a, a little example here is, a, is, is probably a good thing. I think that, um, that stereotypes of age, uh, much like uh, Mr. Case said a few minutes ago, uh, need to be reevaluated. Uh, I think there are a lot of folks in the boomer generation or maybe even traditionalists that are still, well, after all, we're children of the 60s, right? We still have a little bit of that uh, sex, rock and roll kind of thing. In our, and so, that's going to be part, who you are is where you were when, right? And maybe that's part of us that lives on forever. Uh, I have a 24-year-old uh, a person we hired as a technical writer. She came uh, in and four days after she came in, we have a mandatory HR thing where they come through and we say, how was your recruiting selection and hiring process? How did it go? And I see it at 10.15 on my schedule. I'm going, ah, do I really have to do this? I'm not a very good CEO. Ah, I gotta do it. Okay, so she comes in. I said, how was your recruiting? Expecting her to say, oh, it was fine, sir. I love my job. She goes, well, I have a couple of things here. And she pulls out her list and she goes, well, the employee benefits weren't laid out correctly in your handbook. <laughs> she goes, the fact of the matter, I had to wait 15 minutes longer than I was scheduled to for my initial interview and time is money. And she makes about four or five lists of things and, and I said, well, is there anything else? And she goes, why, yes, as a matter of fact, there is. And, and just like you said, very respectful, very efficient, and in so, so doing, uh, of course, my response was what? Defensive, right? No, I'm sure that it's in the employee handbook, right? Oh, no, I've got it here. She brings it out, shows me everything. And I, I thanked her. Uh, we went and we did the work to fix that. We made it public that, hey, here's somebody who's spotting improvement. Uh, opportunities in our company, and she became a cult hero overnight, four days into the company. To me, that's trust building, it's informal leadership, and I think that it's the kind of thing that, that we as baby boomers and, and, and traditionalists need to be able to fall in behind. The, where you're at on the vertical um, organizational chart does not map, I think, to the reality of some of this cross-generational stuff. And, and it just seems like now, when there's an issue of uh, a matrix or compliance or something like that, I naturally fall in behind this young lady. So I'll go ahead. Yeah, and one of the things, it's a great question because I think that the other aspect of it in terms of age and maturity is there is no correlation. 
Okay, with all due respect, I don't think this scientifically it's ever proven it. And sometimes people think with age there's wisdom, and some of the dumber people <laughs> I know are the oldest. I'm waiting. But anybody, a quick show of hands. Anybody here have a two-year-old daughter or granddaughter? Okay. Based on demographics, they can live to 100. All right. Based on demographics, a child two years old, a boy, can live till 89. Now, I can remember telling my daughter, who has a 10 and 8 year old daughters, that their children can meet, live until 100. And she said, Marry rich girls, we're in for the long haul. <laughs> okay. So maybe maturity and wisdom, there is a correlation. <laughs> Well, along these lines, and this is, and again, I sound like I'm trying to, I'm, I'm with a bunch of psychologists trying to work out my family problems, but um, no, I, 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 one of the things that, just culture, and I know that, Tony, you spent a lot of time in that area, and the issues of, of just culture is everybody embraces it until it happens to them. And I got, I got yanked aside by the boss, my wife, and when I got a little overzealous with just culture, basically I went high and right on my eldest daughter and took away her cell phone, God forbid, and for a month. Well, that lasted about six hours in, when the boss came in and intervened because it wasn't, and she was right. I mean, I kind of did go a little high and right over a small petty issue that it built. But my question for you is, when you look at just culture, how do you, how do you, it sounds great in principle, this idea that we're going, to, we're going to keep people in line in a just way. But in practice, it's very difficult and it erodes trust in an organization. I've seen organizations fail because they're so draconian about how they deal with things. What are your thoughts in that and how, how that affects trust that you've engendered in the system? And how do you, as a leader, balance the two? My, this is the quietest Tony's ever been, by the way. I, I'm, I'm going to talk last on this one. I think. Uh, yeah, time will, time I, will start. I just to... think it's fragile. I think it. There, I think that the issue of trust is uh, the boomers were skeptical. Frankly, our ability to trust has been restrained by our conditioning, and frankly, the, the lifestyles we've had. The generation X, the younger ones, Generation Y, it's conditional. They will trust because they trust their parents. They will trust you because you are an authority figure. But God help you if you betray that, and it does not take much. And I'm going to defer to Stephen here, because some of the things that in his books here talks about how you engender it, and there, to me, are where the real lessons are. Yeah, well, here's a, let me share a brief story that will kind of make this point, and it involves uh, kids, too. So, Good, I'm, I'm all ears. Yeah, <laughs> and, and it shows you, though, how trust can be built, how it can be lost, and then also maybe how it can be restored. A few years ago when my son turned 16, you know, he was excited to drive. So we were all excited to, to drive. And so we, my, my wife and I met with them and said, look, we're happy to let you drive. You can even use the family car. But you need to be aware there's some, driving is a privilege, not a right. So we tried to clarify expectations. See, one of the key things in a just culture or anything else is to have clear expectations. Because if you have clear expectations and the accountability tied to those expectations, then things work and it looks and feels just. But if the expectations aren't clear, right. and then you step in and hold people accountable and they're unclear expectations, it can look like you're violating that. So we tried to clarify expectations. And we, you know, it was, it was the stuff you would expect. Be safe, go the speed limit, wear your seatbelt, obey the laws. You got it, son? Yeah, got it, dad. Are you clear on these rules? Because if you violate these rules, you'll lose the privilege to drive. Don't worry, he said. <laughs> well, everything was great for the first month. They'll never forget, about a month into it, uh, the phone rings. This was, uh, it was, it was a Friday night at midnight. Uh oh. <laughs> the phone rings. Nothing good happens at midnight. My wife, his mother, answers the phone, and I hear her say these words. Well, I'll let you talk to his father. Officer. <laughs> and she hands the phone to me, and sure enough, it is the police. My son has been pulled over for speeding, excessive speeding, as in going 83 miles an hour in a 25 mile an hour zone. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, yeah. He wanted to work in this industry. See, he got to prove it. Well, well uh, he's a good kid, 
he, uh, he just had teenage judgment. <laughs> he, tr- he said, well, Dad, I was just trying to get home for a curfew, so I had to hurry really fast to make it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, here's the, here's the thing. We played this thing out, and we went to court. And the judge fined him $555, U.S. dollars. Well, that was hard uh, because uh, we made him pay it, took away all of his savings from his summer job. But then what was surprising to us, it, it was surprising that the judge did not take away his license, did not suspend it. So guess who did? <laughs> That's right, we did, his parents. Why? I'll tell you why. Because we wanted him to trust us. And we felt like if we didn't hold him accountable to what we agreed to mutually, that he wouldn't trust us. And neither would his brothers and sister. Oh, that was hard on him. He was embarrassed. It was hard on all of us. But after three or four months, came back to me and said, Dad, I'm ready to drive again. I asked, are you clear about the rules? And he said, I've never been more clear about anything in my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, this ended in a happy way because it's been a few years now. He's been a model driver ever since. How do we know? Well, we observe it. We see it. But we also hear from his friends and from his friends' parents. When they're going somewhere and their parents ask, hey, where are you going? They might hear, don't worry, Mom. Don't worry, Dad. We're going with Covey. <laughs> And that means we are going the speed limit. We are wearing seatbelts. Believe me, this is no fun at all. (laughs) But you see, he has earned that reputation. He has behaved himself out of the problem that he behaved himself into. You can't talk yourself out of a problem that you behaved yourself into. The only way out, in such a case, is to behave your way out. My son has done it. Here's the good news. The trust is not only back to where it was, is actually higher than it ever was. It's not easy, but through his behavior, he's rebuilt and restored and even gained in the trust. So the key learnings for us in this process are clear expectations and accountability. They work together, hand in glove. That's what makes smart trust smart. If you're not having expectations and accountability, then it might be a blind trust. You might be giving too much trust out. It might be pretty risky. So clear expectations, high accountability, that enables you to follow this process, but then also recognize the importance of behavior, to behave your way into trust, and if you lost the trust, it's the only way to behave your way out of it is, is by what you do and how you do it. My son had to learn that lesson, and, uh, and, but he learned it once, and, and uh, I don't think he's going to repeat that again um, because it, it came from that experience. So, uh, so that's a kind of a, a way of thinking about it through our behavior. You can't talk yourself out of a problem that you behave yourself into. Got a behavior way out. It's still in the spirit of family therapy here. Let me share a family <laughs> story. One of my brothers was a drummer for Alice Cooper in the 70s. And wow. his younger, one of his sons, his middle boy, when he got his driver's license, I was visiting and he comes in and he picks up the keys and says, Dad, I'll be home at midnight. And his father said, You just got your license. You'll be home at, at 10 30. Just to show the respect and the trust, et cetera, Sean disappears for a second, comes back with a picture of his father with a Budweiser in his hand and a snake around his neck, (laughs) and just holds up the picture. And his father says, okay, midnight, but absolutely, (laughs) not a second before. So we're back to that issue of respect and trust. But there's there's a a lesson learned here. It goes back to something that Stephen has said, is that they're not going to confront you like my generation did. They're going to assume that they can persuade you if they treat you respectfully. And that message translates into the workforce as well. Go ahead, Tony. Yeah. I want to get serious for a second because I think when, you use, when we use terms like just culture and safety management systems, there are two, t- two kinds, real ones and phony ones. And, and I'm not even sure that the phony ones don't outnumber the real ones in our industry. And it, it, people are dying behind words because we don't do the necessary things. We don't do the behaviors to make these things more than rhetoric. And some of you know, and trust me, I am a huge fan of just culture. I am a huge fan of safety management systems. But sometimes I think we'd be better without them. Oh my God, get him off the stage. I can hear Greg's (laughs) things going, get him off there, get him off there. (laughs) Here's why. Because I think a lot of people hide behind the words and hide behind the notebooks. 
They come in and, and, and they, they make sure they have everything to pass their ISBEO audit or their Transport Canada audit or whatever it is. And it's sort of the same people that believe compliance is not getting caught on paper, not the behaviors they're actually doing. And so when we talk about just cultures, I like one of my favorite phrases is most just cultures aren't. They're just not. Right. Because they're words. And then when it comes down to somebody making a determination, either they say, well, here's my, here's my matrix. If you did this, I've got to suspend you for six weeks. Six weeks, it's right here. Aviation is nothing if not defined by the situation, right? I mean, back to my, my experience there when I droned into to liberal Kansas, my boss defined the situation and said, you were there. I trust you. So there's got to be some flexibility in a just culture to where you can't just do an if-then matrix. On the other hand, there's got to be accountability. And I'm not sure it can or should always be transparent. Now, that makes just culture pretty damn hard, doesn't it? If somebody comes in to me and says, I did this, and, and here's some mitigating circumstances I wish the rest of the world didn't know. My son called me last night and wanted more money for his drug habit so he could support his uh, whatever, you know? And, and I'm having all of these other problems, and oh, by the way, my mother just got diagnosed with cancer, and I'd prefer to continue to my, my work out here today without the rest of the world looking at me and pitying me, but I'd, I'd like to put this on the table before you pass judgment on me, boss. That flies in the face of everything that, you know, well, it's got to be totally transparent. It's got to be the same for everybody. So I think when we say the words just culture, we are talking about levels of sophistication that most leaders, certainly me, have never been trained to implement. Never been trained to implement. Um, I'll, I'll hold my discussion of safety management systems but I, to, for a later point, but I think in the same way, we're much better. SMS is more plug and chug but the same level of discernment, connoisseurship, and discretion makes the difference between a good one, a bad one, and one that doesn't ex exist at all but still sits there in name. And the last thing I'll tell you is one of the things that at the Air Force Academy, just Air, United States Air Force Academy, just down the road from where I live, they replaced real military police with rent-a-cops a while back. And they took the guns away. Eventually, they gave them the guns back. And, and my wife said, why do they bother? Why bother having anybody at all? And I said, well, it's the illusion of security. Maybe somebody driving by will look, see somebody in uniform. But the more I thought about it, I thought, are we less safe than if we just left the gates open and made everybody more vigilant? I don't know, but something to think about. Hey, there's another one on here. I, this is, I, I swear my wife is sending these in because this is all our family. Because I'm never home anymore, and we do, we Skype to save money on the long distance phone calls. But here's a great one because this is really happening and I'm seeing this now in academia and, 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 and every venue. How do we build and retain trust in a virtual workplace where we don't have the opportunity for face-to-face -face interactions? If you've got to deal with people and, you're, and I can't see them and I can't see their body position, and how do you, how do you deal with that? How do you ensure trust? And even in, if we're starting talking about some of the things with just culture, how do you discipline? How do you ensure accountability? You know, it's, it's still, it still comes down to behavior. It's just that in a virtual environment, you have to be more deliberate about it and more explicit. I'll give an example. Um, this this uh, person told me his story of how when he, uh, he was going to telecommute, work out of his home, right. and he had a new boss, and the boss took the approach of, you know, I can't see you, Therefore, I don't know if I can fully trust you. And this person said, okay, that's kind of my starting point. He was pretty smart about it. And he just, he just was more deliberate, more explicit, more conscious about clarifying expectations and then practicing accountability, showing what he'd done, how he'd done it. And he built up the trust with that boss by saying, hey, look, you asked me to do this. Here's what I've done. And here's what I learned from this. And he was just more deliberate about it, more explicit. And, and he was able to build trust, build it faster. So it's the same behaviors. You still got to talk straight. You still got to show respect. You got to listen first. You got to clarify expectations. You got to keep commitments. It's just that in virtual settings, 
because of the lack of proximity and that sometimes face-to-face -face connection, you have to take steps to compensate for it. And ways to compensate are to be more deliberate about it, more explicit about it, about what you're doing, why you're doing it. So it could be, hey, here's my intent. I want to I wanna have your trust. I want to earn it. I want to be worthy of it. Because if we can trust each other, everything's better. So you declare your intent. And then you might signal your behavior. You tell them what you're going to do. So if I, if I tell you something, I'm going to be talking straight to you. If I have an agenda, I'm going to be as transparent as I can with you. If I make a commitment, I'm going to keep it or else I won't make it. See, I'm letting people know where I'm going. I'm, I call it signaling your behavior. You tell them what to look for. It's like when you're driving on the, on the freeway, if you're in the middle lane, you want to go to the left lane, you should turn on your blinker. Now, you're not doing that for yourself. You know what you're going to do. You're doing it for everybody else so that they might know what you're going to do. And so that's what I'm talking about, signaling your behavior. Tell them what you're going to do. And then the most important of all these things is to do what you just said you were going to do. Deliver. Follow through. You said it, now do it. And in the, if you do that, you can accelerate the building of trust. Now, if someone just always delivers, they will grow trust. But in a virtual environment, you'll grow it even faster if you declare your intent, you signal your behavior, and then you deliver. You'll grow it faster because those first two steps will enable people to be more aware of it, be looking for it more, see it more. And when they see you then follow through on it, they'll say, ah, just like he said, just like she said, I can trust this. And you'll build it faster. <laughs> My, me. My, my only caution. <laughs> I was trying to figure out how not to do that. Where's, where's the cough button? <laughs> my, my only caution would be, don't do those first two steps if you're not going to do the third. <laughs> don't declare your intent and then tell them what you're going to do and then not deliver on it because you'll also destroy it faster. So it's an accelerated trust, but it's also a, a faster way to lose trust if you're not serious about it. But those are a couple thoughts that can help you accelerate in a, in a virtual environment. I, I want to extend Stephen's thoughts to if, if you're a boomer manager working with a virtual workforce. There's the uh, words that were used in the political domain in the US during the dismantling of the uh, nuclear missiles, trust but verify. What happens is that exactly what Stephen is saying in terms of implementing the appropriate behaviors will be much more reassuring to older managers if there is a metric system there right. where they can manage it and control it, a dashboard. I want to take Best Buy as an example. They measure everything, OK? They're one of the environments that really engages their workforce. They treat them respectfully. And they can point to 0.1% increase in engagement translates in Stephen 70,000 K per associate in sales. But, yeah. Just right. because of the ability to create a positive workforce, but measure how it's working on an ongoing basis. That, could I just add on this yeah, trust but verify? Um, Tom's right on on this. See, that, that enables trust to be smart, smart trust, especially in a low trust world. And I was just in Russia, and in fact, the trust but verify is really a Russian, Russian right. proverb. And, and uh, I, was, I was just there, and a lot of people kind of use trust but verify as an excuse to not trust anyone. <laughs> and and uh, so it can be used as a hammer, just kind of just say, hey, I just don't trust, trust but verify, and, and, you know, and I can't verify here. But done, used correctly, it really is an and approach. It's that I want to trust, I have a high propensity to trust, I recognize that if we can trust each other, things work better, but I've got to be smart about it. And the verification could take different forms. When there's high risk, a lot at stake, there's going to be a greater verification. When there's lower credibility of the people that you're trusting, they're not as known as, or as established, their track record's not as strong, there's going to be more verification. But when the risk is moderate or lower and the credibility of the people is higher, then the need to verify the check goes down, like Bill talked about today. When two colleagues working together trust each other, they don't have to verify and check everything the other says. That's where trust leads out, and they've already done the verification going in. Um, let's take Transport Canada. Um, I'm able to go get on a plane and not think about safety because I know someone's doing the work of verify. That the airlines are doing it in conjunction with Transport Canada, FAA, different regulatory associations. There's verification taking place, and because the verification is happening, 
It enables me to trust. So these really work together. It can be pushed to either extreme. You can have too much verify and not enough trust. And that can happen especially within organizations and cultures. And, and that won't give you the kind of safety culture that you want if it's all rules and not building a high trust culture. Then you can be at the other extreme too, where you have all trust and no verify, no expectations, no accountability to that. You're not measuring. And you know, you're saying, well, I trust everyone, but they're not clear and it may not come back to you. So either extreme can get you in trouble. But, uh, but a smart approach is trust and verify, but the type of verification depends upon the situation. You know, to, to Tony's point, every situation is different. The situation, the risk, and the credibility of the people. I'll give you one last story on this. I was with um, um, an admiral, of a, a US admiral of a nuclear submarine, a commander of a submarine. And we were talking about this trust idea, and he said, well, look, we have protocols to do anything on our ship, to go to the bathroom. There's a protocol, there's a process, a procedure. Are you suggesting that we shouldn't have those? And that's being distrustful of our people. We shouldn't have them. And they said, not at all, because the risk in this case, this is a nuclear submarine, the risk is so great, it actually shows tremendous respect to have those protocols. It shows it to everybody. And so in that case, because the, <laughs> turned it off, because the risk is so great, the need to verify is also great. But there might be other situations where it's not a nuclear summary. And, and, and you're working with two colleagues, two peers working together, and the need to extend trust to each other is the greater need. The verification, in effect, has been done. And colleagues, peer pilots working together, trusting each other, and that is maybe a better approach in the long run. So those two things, trust and verify. But I think the starting point is important. And that's for most of us as leaders, we start with trust. And we add to it the verification that's needed. I've got, um, and again, back to my family here, uh, because this one's a really, really good one. I just had this discussion with my daughters and wife out to dinner last week. And as I'm looking at two young girls that are going to be very successful, no doubt in my mind, we, they were switched to birth or something, but they're doing very well. And here's the thing, I look around this room and it's about 75% men, 25% women at best. And I look around this room and, and there's a lot of leaders here. And this question is a, is a very good one and probably more appropriate today because I can tell you that, I don't know about y'all, but I'm pretty sure I know Tony pretty well. When he goes home, he's not in charge. I'm not in charge. And most of us are not, so the leaders are at home. And this is a great question. We're talking about leadership, maturity, age, et cetera. But in corporate America, we find females underrepresented in leadership positions. It's getting better, but what are your thoughts on that in terms, because it's clear the leadership abilities are there because they're leading homes, which is a heck of a lot harder job than what I do. And so I guess the question is, how do you, how do you do that? How do you fix that? It's not getting better fast enough. Right, I agree. Because, you know, frankly, we still have the old boy network, the age bias, the, uh, uh, the gender issue. And let's just give you a data point here in the United, here in the United States, excuse me, over 65% of the people getting an MBA right now are women. All right. And I think that that not the combination of the education model and the opportunity model is going to push it. But I live in Peru. The number of women in an MBA program in Peru is less than 20%. Great. They are decades behind. All right. And as a matter of fact, culturally, it is considered to be an anomaly to be a professional woman. I think the issue here is we have to just step back and go shame on us because we're not doing enough to promote the interests of women. We're not doing enough to uh, uh, take advantage of that talent. And the women are just as good, in many ways, better managers and leaders than men, but there's been a truncated opportunity. One of the things I want to shift this back to the generation and trust issue here is this is not our finest hour in terms of leaders, how we have dealt with women, just as in, in many other representative examples, race, et cetera, in the United right. States, not right. our finest hour. You don't change those things overnight. And it's always an inside out strategy. But it, the thing that really is going to happen is, and going back to Stephen's hypothesis on trust is, if you're a manager 
whether a young manager or old manager, and you deliberately, overtly, or in any way represent that you're holding somebody back because of gender or race, oh, yeah. you are toast. Right. You right. are toast. I would suggest that your life expectancy as a leader is short-lived unless you own the company, because nobody's going to want to work for you. And with all of the opportunities that people have, they will leave. Okay, go ahead, John. Yeah, I'll take a shot at this one from a slightly different angle. I'll come back to the gender issue at the end. I'm not abandoning it. But, but the question I have is not where are the women coming to come into our industry, but where are anyone coming into our industry? Um, the aviation industry as a whole, um, much like everything else in the science slash vocation industry is having trouble recruiting that next generation. And, uh, and I think part of it is uh, those of us that have been in the industry through some ups and downs right now, uh, I hear a lot, I read all the pilot blogs, and I mean like all of them, I've got them all kind of things, and i got my passwords. There's not a lot of happiness and glee in the senior echelons of our industry. And I'm gonna do a quality assurance check here. Nobody's used a slide yet. But could I have the folks in back bring up slide one as a case in point? There it is. Professionalism, that's not my job. Uh, <clears throat> what I hear is, ah, it sucks. The, it's not like it used to be. We're losing our retirement. That technology is taking, I, I came to this industry because I wanted to be dynamic and engaged and challenged. And now they're telling me I need a checklist to go to the bathroom and hook up the autopilot and it'll do everything for me. And, and so I think the challenge for us is to be a little bit more professional and a little bit more positive about how we relate our stories. I mean, the, it's not HR's job to go find that next generation of people. I hear people say, where are they? Well, they're everywhere. They're the same place everybody else is. The, the challenge for us in recruiting that next generation into our industry who will grow into leaders. I don't, like we had in our first discussion, we don't recruit leaders, right? We, we grow them, unless Scott's right and there's a, there's a gene there that we can test for. So I think the first thing we need to do is be more positive and professional in, in our discussions, in our behaviors, and of course, that's gotta lead with what we actually feel inside. You know, and, and these guys have been around the world a whole lot, so have I. This industry right here ain't so bad. No. There's a lot of people out there without the opportunities that we have to do wonderful things. And, and that needs to infuse our spirit of professionalism. And I think that next generation will come in spite of what the media is doing or the politicians are doing or the economy is doing. I think our personal responsibility to that next generation, be they male or female, uh, black, white, doesn't matter is to come at this with a very positive, gosh, I wish I'd be around for the next 25 years to see what's gonna happen attitude. And I think the rest will, will happen naturally. Um, clearly, the legal doors that Tom pointed out are opening. Um, there, are, there are opportunities, although a lot of the, the gray-haired dinosaur male gender folks like me will probably um, wash out and make room for, for more opportunities for for uh, women and, and, and minorities, et cetera. But I think at the end of the day, this is about core recruiting, which is everybody's responsibility in this room. And I think it's a simple thing. Tell great stories at home. I think that's where it starts. There, there is another question on here that, and I, I think it really makes sense when we start talking about trust, is that I've noticed, for whatever reason, with, with maybe Greg as an exception, a, every VP safety I ever talked to lives about two years, and then they're gone. <laughs> I don't know about your clients, but the safety guys don't have longevity. Well, he just got promoted out of his job. Yeah. Oh, you did too? Well, way to go. Congratulations, <laughs> I think. <laughs> but to me, I look at it, and there's such a revolving door with management. And people are changing. And remember the old adage when we were in the military, this too will pass. And so they would wait me out because I'm going to leave in three years. And so the, the civilians and others could just wait me out. How do, you, how do you manage trust in, a, in this revolving door world where management constantly turns over and the new guy comes in and you've got to now please a new boss? The average tenure for a Fortune 500 CEO right now is three and a half years. 
Okay, the average tenure for a CIO in the Fortune 500 is 2.7 years. There is a lot of churn in many ways because of the circumstances. I think you need to separate out the issue of trust from performance and circumstances. But if you're focusing on the trust issue, what happens is, what is the legacy that you create while you are there? And is it something that can be leveraged by the enterprise? I don't think it's an issue of tenure. You can have people there for a year, they make an impact, you can have people there for 20 years who don't. It depends, going back to Stephen's point, about how, how they behave while they are there. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, I, I, I make the point that low trust is a tax. Everything will take you longer and cost you more when the trust is low. High trust is a dividend. Everything happens faster, costs you less when the trust is high. Bill mentioned it this morning. When there's high trust, you don't have to do the excessive verifying, checking, and validating when there's common trust there. But when there's low trust between pilots, with staff, with teams, when there's low trust, everything will take you longer, cost you more. That is a tax, it's real. So if you could get this um, operating in an organization, building a high trust culture, um, then that's even a, a stronger thing than only having relationships. Now, it starts with the relationships. It's always inside out. I started today's conversation from my perspective saying it's inside out. You look in the mirror first, you start with yourself, then you move into your relationships, then into your teams, into the group, into the organization, then you move out in the marketplace, inside out. If, you, if you're able to do that and build trust in a culture and a team, then a, a high trust culture is able to have some turnover and people are able to come in because there's clear expectations of here's how we behave, here's why. It's part of how we build trust and accountability to that. And you can kind of absorb and roll with that. In a low trust culture in particular, the turnover can really be harmful. The new person comes in and there's a tax. So if I'm a new leader and I come in and there's prior leaders, it's an inheritance tax. <laughs> I maybe didn't create it. Maybe I haven't even done anything, but I inherit this low trust tax coming into this new role. And, and so it puts a greater premium again on, on that leader being deliberate, being explicit, declaring their intent, trying to let people know what and why and how they're gonna behave in order to kind of earn their way back into trust, even though they, they necessarily didn't create it. So it really comes down to saying, ultimately, if we can get to where we're building, not just relationships of trust, that's where you start, but also a culture of trust. And then that, see, that's really how you also get a safety culture too, as opposed to just um, safety programs and initiatives. You really want that culture. The culture of trust is what really changes the game. Now, again, practically speaking, to Tony's point earlier, it's always messy. And, and um, there's a lot of, uh, um, you know, you, I, I walked into situations where the trust was extraordinarily low. And it was just the reality. There was a low trust tax everywhere. And it took a while to regain, rebuild, restore. In some cases, some people can't do it. But I've also seen it happen where you build a high enough trust culture and it can, can, it, you get the flywheel rope going and this can perpetuate itself. And it becomes part of how people are expected to behave in ways that grow and earn the trust of their people. And, and that's where you want to be. And that will help you in these transition processes. Because that's not unusual. That's happening in a lot of places. But still, people can do it if in a high trust culture, better than a low trust culture, which will always take you longer, cost you more. Let me take on to that, Scott. I think once you get to that point, Stephen just described, I think there's also some things about values of an organization, and it can't be everything. You know, like I run into lots of organizations that say excellence, excellence, and excellence, 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 excellence. But you know, and what? What are you known for? And like you mentioned, DuPont, and there's there's certain organizations that are known for certain things, and those values will be there whether somebody is the CEO or the next guy is the CEO or there's no CEO. And I think it's incumbent upon leaders, informal leaders and formal leaders, and when I talk about informal leaders, I'm talking about the guys or gals out there who people look to for advice regardless of their position. It could be the janitor, it could be the maintenance guy, might be your chief pilot, who knows. Um, I'll give you an example from my company. We have lots of things we like to say we're good at, but the one thing that we have always insisted on 
is extending the hospitality of the company to any visitors. It's just part of what we do. Uh, one day I'm, uh, I'm in my office, which is around probably 100 feet or so from the main entrance to the company, and a homeless guy comes in the door asking if he can use the restroom to wash off. And uh, one of our newer employees uh, came out and said, can I help you? There's a Carl's Jr. right over next door. And as he was saying this, another employee came out and said, I got this. Let me show you the way to the, to the washroom. And then she came back and pulled him aside and in no uncertain terms said, you just violated the core of what we are. And I'm, I'm sitting over there just glowing, feeling how powerful this idea of hospitality has become in, in my little company. So I think values, and you can't, be, you can't be everything to all people, but whether it's hospitality or excellence in technology or, or whatever it is that you're known for transcends those transformations. I'm not sure if they have a shock plate on my chair, but I've been getting a warning that if I don't ask this next question, I'm probably going to fill something. Um, and this is a good one. I was waiting for the right time. If we invest in training, how do we retain that talent without continually having to throw money at the problems? So changing, we've been talking about trust for a long time. Now we need to kind of shift gears a little and put your training hats on. If we're gonna, if we're gonna retain people that we've trained, I mean, because this is the thing, this is the real dynamic, because it's, up, it's an upward mobile, and I, I work with my people, and my goal is to make them portable. And I make them portable through training, and now they leave. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? How do we retain people then? Are we working cross purposes here? I don't think training is the only thing you can do to retain. If you look at what the uh, studies about the, we'll call it the generation X, generation Y are, number one is the learning opportunity in terms of why they would determine whether or not they want to stay with an enterprise, training being an aspect of that. If you want to really capture their imaginations, if you really want to promote their interest in staying with your enterprise, it's not just the training, it's the training with the most generous interpretation translated into learning. Okay, and if, by that I mean just a constant stimulation. An element of that, and it's on the list as well in this particular grouping, I'll say, say 32 down to 23 year olds, is how good are they mentored? Right. Which is an aspect of training. The, the portability of people, there's just going to be a lot more churn than there have been in, in our generations. You know, there's, there's nobody in my generation that worked in the United States that either didn't lose their job or know somebody who lost their job in either the 80s or 90s. So, enterprise sustainability and continuity, that's always been fiction. But at this particular point, if you've got somebody that's good or you have some people who are making contributions, you've really got to challenge their brain. Because it's not about money, it's not about career potential, it's not their priority anymore. So the training question is a great question, but I would expand that to anything you can do for learning and mentoring, that's your leverage. It's interesting you mentioned that because one of the questions I get asked, I, I did a lot of hiring in the federal government, and it seemed to me that I never hired, and I would always ask them question, you know, what are your plans, what are your short and long-term plans? And anybody that said they wanted to work with the federal government for the next 30 years, more often than not, I didn't hire them. I don't want somebody that wants to work with me for 30 years, because that's not the person that's hungry. I want the person everybody else wants. And, and then I have, to work, I have to work to retain them. I mean, I think that's a great question, because it's the fear that you're going to train them out of a good, out of your job. Well, that's okay. To me, that's okay because if I could, then the next guy comes along and says, you know what? You wanna know what the last guy did in that job? He's now working at such and such. And it's a motivational tool. So, but go ahead. I, I, yeah, I, I think there's two things. One is it doesn't, the, the unstated hypothesis to that statement is that if you throw a lot of money and you get somebody well-trained, that you won't be able to keep them. And, right. And I, and I hear what Tom is saying about that. I think he has hit on something tangentially that's, that's vitally important here. And that is the best organizations that I have seen invest their money not in sending someone to a training center, 
but to improving their internal Internal. capacity to train with the resources at hand where they are. So sometimes that's bringing in an instructional design expert. Sometimes it's bringing in a data analyst. Sometimes it's bringing in a training expert onto their staff as a non-traditional position. Well, in org chart, it says chief pilot, standards captain, safety captain, it's all I got. Well, maybe it's time to bring in a training captain. Uh, An example of maybe the best industry best practice I have seen in the past two years, uh, a company that shall remain unnamed uh, in Dallas-Fort Worth area, has begun uh, tracking aircrew error and maintenance error and feeding that into their hazard and incident tracking system through a training expert. So you come down from flying and it says, there'll be a list of 20 questions for the flight. Did you, did you or anyone else violate sterile cockpit? Or did you uh, follow stabilized approach criteria? Did you, did you, did you, did you, did you? And they, they've come up with these, these data points they want to collect data on. Absolutely non-attributional. Um, if you violated sterile cockpit, does that necessarily make it a hazard? Would it make it into your hazard and incident tracking system? Probably not. But if five people did it this week, or if 20 people did it this month, or if three people did it last month, but 10 this month. So they've begun to look deeper, and they use proactive data then to train. And in so doing, they close the loop between saying, what you are telling me is important to me, we will give you near immediate feedback on these issues, and we're going to do this internally without spending a lot of money. So I think that the, the essence of building the trust through training is by taking what you have where you're at and taking it seriously. And it's not just something we throw money at it at, at one of the, the major 800 pound training gorillas that are out there. There's a lot of it you must do there because of level of sophistication. But the same company, when they go to their OEM for their simulators, have found the last couple of times the instructors are saying, we learned from them. We didn't teach them a thing. So they have become a couple of standard deviations ahead of the rest by taking this training function internally, and that's build trust over. So I think that training's not a cure-all for everything, but I definitely think it's a weave between the talent and the trust piece. Great, let me me, uh, um, agree with what Tony just said, and also Tom on this training approach. It's not the cure-all, but it is necessary. Necessary, but insufficient. Um, I'll never forget a time when there was a CEO of a company that was considering, he had 2,500 people in his company, and he was considering this training initiative that he felt was vital, that everyone get it, and that without this, they were becoming less and less relevant by the day. But there's a lot of turnover in this industry, and it was gonna cost a lot of money, take some time to do all this training. And so he was being queried by his board, and a board member asked him a question. He said, well, gosh, what if we spend all this time and money training everybody and then they all leave. CEO said, it's a good, good question. But let me ask you this. What if we don't train them and they all stay? <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and his point was, we're not relevant. None of us. We're losing our relevancy in the marketplace with the customers. And if we lose that relevancy, we'll ultimately lose our capabilities and we will lose the credibility and and then the trust in the marketplace. And so, um, but by doing this, it keeps us relevant and companies need to reinvent themselves, recreate themselves. Sometimes industries need to recreate, reinvent themselves to stay relevant. And if you keep that relevancy, you'll keep the credibility and the trust, but you can lose the relevancy and that can happen at a company level or at a, uh, individual leader level or a contributor, whatever the role might be. Look at what Apple computer has done in the last uh, uh, 14 years. Uh, In 98, they were all but left for dead. It's totally irrelevant, declining market share, but they completely um, reinvented themselves, really. They reinvented themselves around the iMac, but then also around the iPod, and then the iPhone, and and, and, uh, then the iPad. And today, they're the most valuable company in the world. It's a process of recreation, reinvention, to stay relevant. Otherwise, they were becoming irrelevant. They were irrelevant for a while, but they recreated themselves. So sometimes 
companies have to do it. Sometimes industries have to do it. Sometimes leaders have to do it. Recreate themselves, that keeps you relevant. But I would also argue this, for those that are worried about losing their people, because they're, they're now trained and they gain these new knowledge, new skills, new capabilities. Um, I think in practice, the reality will be that you'll get, you'll get greater retention of them, greater engagement of them, greater loyalty, because they, to, to Tom's point, they want this. They want, they, 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 they appreciate that you care about them developing their skills and their capabilities. They value that and they'll reciprocate the trust you showed them back to you in, you know, because they show that you show that you care in what matters to them. This matters to them. You cared. Yes, they're more employable. Some may leave, but more will become engaged and more engaged than they were before. They'll stay with you longer on the, for the most part. And you know what? And you'll be more relevant. So I think it's win, win, win all the way around even though there's always some risk in the process of losing some talented people as they become more capable. But you're going to be better off for it. Go ahead, oh, yeah. I got one after him too, please. Okay. There's, there's something else that I'm, I'm sorry if this is going to be too provocative. I think you need to get used to the fact that you are going to lose them. There's one right. thing that's emerging right now very, very clearly is the, the younger workers, 20s, 30s, they're not planning on staying with you for 10 years. That's not part of their game plan. In the commercial sector, there are many compensation specialists right now looking at the use of long-term incentives and asking themselves the question, are they even valuable anymore? Because they go up to a 28-year-old and say, congratulations, you can now enter the long-term incentive plan and you will vest in five years. And that's prompting an answer, dude, I don't think I'm going to be here five years from now. What use is that to me? So the issue here is you leverage as much as you can. That's the training piece. I wouldn't train people with the concern about losing them. I mean, to Stephen's point, if you don't train them, then you've got a different problem. But I do think you need to start speculating and projecting where your workforce is and will come from, because I don't think there's as much continuity out there as we are used to. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, and here's, here's one last piece of this. We can't allow training to become a technology tail chase. We can't allow training to become merely defined as a requirement by the regulator. There's too much at risk. Um, I'll, a classic example, and I know I've been, I've been um, it's been heresy from the beginning, so I might as well keep saying it. You can believe that fatigue is the only physiological factor that matters in aviation, right? Fatigue, fatigue, fatigue. Fatigue risk management system, fatigue this, fatigue that. Rest this, new schedules, blah, blah, blah. It's everywhere, right? Important, it's vitally important. I know pilots get tired, they go to sleep, they make mistakes. But you know what? They also get malnourished. They get dehydrated. They get distracted due to stress and emotional triggers. All things that are equally trainable and easier to manage than fatigue. Ask yourself, and I'll ask you, why did we trigger to fatigue as the issue? I, I don't know. I honestly couldn't answer that question other than it popped up in a couple of accident investigations. What about blood sugar? I mean, all of these things are out there. Uh, and we know if there's one thing that's come out of the last 10 years on the human side of the equation, it's that things of the body control things of the mind more than the other way around. If you're dehydrated or, or unfit or you're aging, the effects of aging, is that a, a, a big issue? But yet you don't see a, a text of aging risk management system out there. Yeah. But somebody will invent one and uh, you know, get it in through the regulator and then we'll do it, right? My point is simply that there are many, many challenges out there that we can and should be addressing if our goal is risk and performance management that are unstated and unmandated by the regulator. And I think that we have to be creative in looking at those things because you can't necessarily go hire a company or an off-the-shelf curriculum or anything to do some of these things. It's going to be dependent on who your people are, what environment they operate in. So I think as we talk about training, sometimes we trigger to what are the requirements, how do I get my guys to send me a flight or wherever it is and get them trained up and get them back with minimum impact on the schedule. That will remain important. Vocational excellence will remain important, but there's a ton of things in this learning and training environment that need to be addressed and, and probably can be addressed fairly cost effectively, uh, proactively rather than reactively. I got this is a 
a challenge question. How's this? Because I'm a big golf fan, and uh, like many people, I fell in love with Tiger Woods, and I fell out of love with Tiger Woods, and now yeah, we won again yesterday. I'm back in love. So, uh, <laughs> but here's the challenge. How do you tell Ti Tiger Woods when he had his kind of fall from grace and he wasn't able to hit any greens in regulation? He just was horrible compared to where he was. And they had the President's Cup and the Ryder Cup. And remember the controversy. For those of you that follow golf, there's a huge controversy here on whether or not Tiger Woods, arguably the best golfer in the last 15 years, and maybe up there with the all-time greats. How do you tell Tiger Woods the best money draw on the tour that he's not going to be part of the Ryder's Cup or part of the President's Cup. How do you, and, and put this in your own context, how do you in your organization take your best person who is having a, having a rough time and tell him he's not going to be part of the company anymore or he's not going to be part of this very special team? How do you do that? Because that plays right into trust. Because a lot of people had problems with that on the tour. Yeah. Well, it's, I, my suggestion would be that the more clear the expectations are, the more easy it is for someone to, to follow through with what the consequences of those expectations are. In, in, in the case, I, I forget who the Writers' Cup captain was or whoever that picked Tiger, but for him, um, his expectations were not necessarily the hottest golfer. Right. I mean, so he used criteria that said, look, I'm looking at being able to withstand pressure, these other things, and, he, and, and so he, he decided that, that he could go with Tiger, Tiger Woods. I think that the, the more clear expectations are of your criteria and your process, then the more bold you can be, including saying, hey, we're not going to pick you because this is what we're looking for. We declared it. But, all, but then also, uh, the more people will understand what you did and why you did it. At the same time, I'll come back to saying that, that uh, you, have to, you still leave room for judgment and for people discerning the situation and so that you're not just a robot into these expectations when the reality has changed and right. things are different and you might have to do, do different things. But, but uh, the more clear you are on expectations, the better, the more bold you can be, the more upfront you can be. So in a work setting, it often looks like this. If someone is being either demoted or moved to a different place where they're, where they're it's seen as going down backward, you know, getting on the different seat on the bus, um, or if they're being let go and, and fired for lack of performance, in most of these cases, it shouldn't be a surprise to them. And if it is, that's a problem. In other words, if someone just got fired for lack of performance and that's a surprise, right. that's a problem. That should be instead very clear that I'm clear, I need to perform and do these things and if I don't, I'll be fired. And the best leaders are upfront about it. They, 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 they clarify expectations, including the F word, not the one F word, the other F word, you'll be fired if you don't do it. Meaning, here's the expectations, here's what we expect and if you don't do this and don't see this kind of improvement, you'll need to be fired. Now whether they say it that way or they, or, or another way, they need to make, make it very clear that what's on the line here, so that if they don't perform, it's not a surprise to anyone that they're let go. And in the case of Tiger, if, if that were the clear expectations of it and they declared it, then it would be more easy to follow through with that. But again, I'm, the Tiger thing is a little bit uh, um, complex in that, in that I don't know who the, the Riders' Cup captain was that made well, the decision made the right choice. criteria. It ended up he won, it, it ended up, but the, the truth of the matter was, it was very controversial. It was controversial. Yeah. The, Go ahead. Tom. Yeah, uh, You started the sports metaphor, so I'll toss this one out. Everybody knows who Tiger <laughs> Woods is. Who knows who Herb Brooks is? He's okay. Hockey. Um, hockey Nation, I would hockey. expect every hand to go up. Herb Brooks, of course, was the coach of the uh, Olympic hockey team in 1980 that beat the Soviets in the so-called Miracle on Ice. He has a very famous statement that says, I don't recruit all-stars, I build an all-star team. And I think sometimes, and I want to tie this into something I do know a little bit about, and that is rogue aviators or rogue practitioners. Sometimes what you will see are extremely talented, charismatic young men and women rocketing up the system with no regard to the collateral damage around them. 
And in the making, you are seeing people that end up causing tremendous damage if you allow them to continue up through the system. So they may appear to be, and they more than appear to be, they may be your best pilot or your best maintainer. But if they don't function well according to the, the values and the ethics and the integrity of your organization, all issues surrounding trust, and you continue to move them up because of their skills and their charisma, um, you, are, you are just adding fuel to a rocket that someday will end uh, very, very badly. And, and of the 37 different, for those of you who don't know, I wrote a book called The Rogue Pilot, uh, Darker Shades of Blue. And since that time, I've looked at 37 different cases of these sort of maladaptive sociopaths. And in each and every one, save one, it ended in death, jail, organizational failure, or mass firings of management. 36 and one, that's, that's something worth derailing downstream a little bit. So it goes way beyond talent and skill set. And you know what? Tiger Woods may just be one of those guys. Yeah, I, I guess my first advice to Tiger would have been, you may, might want to sleep alone periodically and help <laughs> me. But I wouldn't have chosen him for the Ryder Cup team. And frankly, I think he was probably surprised to be chosen, to right. Stephen's point. You know, he knew he was distracted. And he knew he was controversial. And he was trying to deal with that in candor. And the, it's, to me, it's a larger question. The Ryder Cup is a team. It's not him against the course. It's the team against the other team. And if that's the case, then you have to have a frank exchange with somebody, whether it's Tiger Woods on golf or somebody. If you know that they're limping along with something, personally distracted or otherwise, if you want to have a trusting relationship, if you want to have a professional relationship, you tell them that. You don't cover for them. You don't do it at the expense of the team. They got lucky. They got very lucky. But I'm not sure that if they hadn't gotten lucky, the controversy wouldn't have been worse, and it would have been worse for Tiger. I don't think they, excuse me, Scott, I don't think they did him any favors. Go ahead, guys. Yeah, I was just going to toss this back at you, Scott. You said, when you were talking to Stephen, you said it worked because they won. <laughs> I'll toss this back at you. Is that the uh, is that the essence of of success or failure? Is whether they won or lost, or you know, that, is there a, something deeper going on here? That's a great point because I don't like to be outcome based, but and I didn't gamble on it. But if I were gambling on it, I would be outcome based. But I think that that's an interesting point because it did breed. If you if you read the golf magazines, it really bred contempt. What you were just saying is that by rising, skyrocketing through, it basically made everybody uncomfortable. Right. And that, that was the story. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, as this, the equivalent of this playing out in the organization, and this is back to Tony's point earlier, is um, that's the key differentiator on culture, is do you, do you do what you say you're going to do? Do you live these values? So I just use an example, um, GE, and what Jack Welch did. Jack Welch talked about two things. He talked about delivering results, so that's the outcome, right. but also living the values. That's the means in which you deliver the results. And it's easy to know what to do with someone that does both, that delivers results and lives the values. Right. They get promoted. Someone that does neither, that's easy too. They need to lead the organization. Someone that, that uh, doesn't deliver results but lives the values, they need to give a, be given a chance to improve their training in such that they can deliver results. They get a chance. The toughest one they found were those people that, that delivered results, but they didn't live the values. Because they got the outcome, but they weren't living the values. And he said that when the culture began to shift at GE was when they decided they would let them go and fire. Because of the fact that, yeah, they got the results, but they didn't live the values, and the values mattered as much as the result. That's when it began to shift, that they were serious about it, that this matters, and suddenly it wasn't just results at all costs, it was results consistent with how we, how we operate as a team, as a group, as a company. So I really believe that, in a sense, ends and means are inseparable. That you cannot do great ends with unjustifiable, Ill, um, unethical, means, that they're, they're wedded together. And how we do what we do makes all the difference, including in building a sustainable culture, a culture of trust, a culture of safety. I mean, I, I think we see that play out all the time in sports, where 
we see, particularly in our in the U.S. college sports, where that happens, where we have winning teams, and then they look a little closer, they peer behind the curtain, and they go, oh my gosh, this is really ugly. My own team, Ohio State, they peered behind the curtain, and, and it was ugly. And so I do think that's, that's a very critical point. And Tony's point, I mean, your, your example, your vignette about your employee that invited the, the person off the street to go ahead and, I mean, to me, that's a stunning moment. And, and it should make you proud. So those are things, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, but I don't think you can, you know, one of the things that's always fascinated me is when you deal with a CEO and you talk about turnover or people leaving an organization and you say, well, who do they report to? And you find out they report to a moron or an abusive personality. And then you say, well, why don't you do something about him? Oh, I can't do that. He's our biggest performer. Now, what the hell does that say about the organization? Where's the trust? Where's the loyalty? So you can be a total zipper head, and as long as you're performing, you're safe. Most organizations would be much better served marching that person out the door. And this goes back to, in, in so many ways, of the thematic that, that we're talking about here, whether it's training, whether it is talent, whether it's trust. I want to go back to Bill's uh, speech this morning. It's all about transformation. And transformation is leadership. These are elements of it. And the, the, the cornerstone of the leadership, all the people who are studying it right now, the Jim Collins of the world and the other people, they're basically saying is, if you want a high-performing organization, be a high-performing leader. And don't accept anything less from yourself and make sure everybody knows that's what you're trying to do. And then move on. I, I, just to change gears a little bit again, and this is one of my questions, because. There's a, we've, we've talked a lot about leadership, trust, talent, those sorts of things. Give me one example, each of you, give me one example where poor leadership led to an accident. And Tony, no fair cheating. You can't use your B-52 that you wrote about. So <laughs> that I'll, would be cheating. I'll, I'll start since you, uh, you've limited me and you're, you think <laughs> I don't have one on the tip of my tongue. Uh, I'll actually give you one accident, one near accident, and I'll be brief in them. Um, Secretary of Commerce Ron Brown uh, was flown by a fully qualified Air Force air crew and a CFIT accident into a mountain in Dubrovnik um, a couple decades ago now. The setup for that accident was um, an unhealthy command climate that everybody migrated away from. People didn't want to be there. The 86th airlift wing in Germany was the sister uh, squadron of the 89th, the guys that fly the President of the United States around. Uh, but it had become a toxic environment and everybody left. Because everybody left, they had to do unwise promotion and upgrades. And they ended up with an aircraft commander that was the senior evaluator in all of Europe in that 737 aircraft and probably wasn't qualified to be making those types of decisions. They put an unhealthy metric of on-time takeoffs in place which forced poor planning in order to get off the ground on time. And in this particular accident, they ended up flying into a closed airspace corridor, had to turn around, got late, got in a rush, used an unauthorized procedure, and kissed a mountain. Uh, classic failures of leadership at multiple levels. Second one, much more personal. Um, I'm now five years into my B-1 bomber evaluator experience. I am an instructor pilot at Dias Air Force Base up on a training sortie and, uh, and a weather system comes across Abilene, Texas and closes the base. I've got enough fuel to hold for about an hour. Wichita, Kansas is my alternate. The deputy commander for operations gets on the radio and says, we must have that airplane on the ground today. It's going to be our competition aircraft for something tomorrow. You get that airplane back on the ground. I'm watching my fuel go down, the weather's not moving. I call back and say, hey, I'm sorry, I gotta go to Wichita. You get that airplane back on the ground, so help me God, Tony, I will, you know, you don't know the wrath of this colonel. Right? Long story short, um, a huge mesoscale thunderstorm popped up between myself and Wichita, Kansas. I was out of gas, out of ideas. I penetrated a level four thunderstorm, landed on a wet runway with 37 and a half knots of crosswind. And that airplane was down for two and a half weeks while they did the structural um, evaluations of the, of the turbulence. Now, my question to you is where was the leadership failure that nearly caused that accident? Was it the colonel pressuring me? 
Absolutely not. It was a pilot in command in that cockpit. And when I went back down to Abilene and we had that discussion, um, that was his point of view as well. No attempt there to shed the responsibility of the person with his hands on the controls right there. At the end of the day, this is about command and control. Never forget those of us that are out there operating this machinery or fixing the machinery. It doesn't do to pass the buck up. It's up to us. Guys? Yeah, I'm not going to speak about uh, the um, aviation industry. I'm just going to use uh, probably one you all know about, Enron. Okay? You may have heard of it. All right, destroyed an economy. <laughs> okay, they even wrote a book about it, The Smartest Boys in the Room. This was an organization that had one value system, making money. And by the way, they didn't even care if they were lying about how much money they made or they were actually making money. That was an accident and it was all about the leadership because the knowledge of this permeated a whole organization. Certainly permeated the leadership team. The one woman who raised her hand and said this was not right was ostracized. This, is the, this goes back to so many things, again, we're talking about today, is it's all about how you walk your own talk in terms of leadership. If you constantly question yourself and you, ask, and you, and you focus on, am I doing the right things right? Am I deserving of this trust I want people to put in me? Then you're fine. If you're going to play innocent until you catch me, then you won't. And eventually you will be caught. And um, um, let me recount uh, an experience. I don't remember all the particulars, but this is taken from Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers. Any of you seen that? Um, in it, he talks about uh, how um, the, the experience of the Korean airline industry. And now, everything I'm describing here has since been addressed and corrected through leadership. But at the time, there were some leadership challenges. This was a few decades ago, and they had a, um, an incident where they literally um, ran out of gas, a plane, a commercial plane, ran out of gas, and people were killed, and it didn't have to happen. And they traced it back to the communication in the cockpit, and, and um, the co-pilot was aware of the situation, but was um, consistent with the Korean culture, was extremely respectful of the senior pilot, who was a very senior pilot. And, and there's different levels of respect in the Korean language, including in how you conjugate verbs and so forth, that reflect this respect. It's a great strength of their culture. But it also, if you push any strength to the extreme, it can become a weakness. And in this case, it became a weakness where the co-pilot did not speak up. Out of fear that he would not be respectful in speaking up, that they were running out of gas. You'd think, well, of course you would, but they didn't. And, and, um, and they ran out of gas, it didn't need to happen. As they researched further, they found that the, at the time, this was some time ago, again, this is in Gladwell's book, the, Korean, the, the, the crash rate, accident rate in this industry was 17 times higher than net global standards. So they had big issues. It was a leadership failure because they weren't addressing the cultural implications. This issue was less, traditional training per se, they'd been trained. It was more the, the culture of how things worked and operate in that given society such that demonstrate respect, which was an extraordinary value, which is a good thing, but still pushed to the extreme can become a weakness, and it was not balanced by talking straight. And they needed to address that culture to where it became more safe, more acceptable, and in fact entirely appropriate and acceptable and required and expected of each other to talk straight as well as demonstrate respect, not just all respect, no straight talk. And they addressed it and confronted it as an industry and today Korea Airlines is safe and, and they're not having those issues. But the failure was they didn't, they didn't recognize the cultural implications of this. <coughs> and they were focusing only on certain uh, programs and checklists and things and didn't recognize the culture. Once they recognized the cultural implications, <coughs> then they took a cultural approach to it, and they were able to dramatically improve their safety and track record. It's really a fascinating study, ultimately in leadership, because it's leadership's responsibility to be aware of, to address, to confront, and to uh, amend those situations to where you have a balance with straight talk and demonstrate respect. Well, we're coming to the end, 
And I don't know if you guys noticed it, but I didn't. There was hardly, I think we might have had two people have to go to the bathroom. That was about it. Nobody's moved. What I'd like to do is wrap up by, first of all, thanking you personally, and I know Greg will be thanking you here in a moment, but I'd like to give you guys an opportunity to, to just a few comments on the way out the door, so to speak, to kind of wrap up and sum up what you've done. I don't know if you guys realize it, but they've talked about all the topics. You were only supposed to talk talent, you were only training, you were only trust, but I think we've got it all, and we've got three very, very uh, worthwhile experts. I'm going to applaud you personally. And, and, and with that, what I'd like to do is just one at a time, go ahead if you have any closing comments to, to pass on to the group. It's been a pleasure to join you, and I have, first off, I have to thank Bill and Greg and Melissa for having me here. This is hands down one of the best run conferences I've ever had the pleasure to speak to, so thank you very much. I've been doing consulting for a long time, and the military background consulting, and particularly all the research and writing I've been doing recently, we're, we're at a, a, an intersection right now where the old rules do not apply. How we think about leading people, how we think about managing people, that's, that's a game that has passed us by. These new workers are going to be challenging us. They're going to be saying things that we think are provocative. And the thing is, it's led me to three conclusions. One is, if you're going to be successful, you need to challenge your own assumptions about what constitutes a good leadership. Second is, is represented in a recent book by Jim Collins, he points out the advantages of being paranoid and constantly asking yourself the question, including about trust, are you deserving of the role that you have? And if not, raising your own hand. And the third one is, and I'm encouraging all our clients to do this is, do not assume these younger generations have it wrong because they're difficult and they're asking provocative questions, albeit in a respectful way. I'm encouraging the leaders to go to school on them and figure out why they're doing it because there's an awful lot of value once you figure out the secret sauce. Thanks. And um, Scott, since we didn't thank you, you did your slightly above average job. <laughs> Quiet round of applause for Scott. <laughs> Well, I, I need to thank them because they loaded me with the questions. Thank Absolutely. you for the questions. Um, two quick things. Uh, one is you mentioned intersections, and the whole idea of the intersection of quality and safety, I think, is a fantastic idea. And it's the only place I know where it's done. And so we get two parts of organizations together here. Um, and I'll tell you a lot of comments I got last year, emails, that sort of stuff after this event, was people were saying, gosh, the wrong people were in the room. If I would have had the people that I really need to hear this safety message here, it would have been, it would have been better if I could have had the, the, the lowest common denominator in the room so they could hear what you guys had to say. And, and those feelings are legitimate, but I think they're wrong. The right people are in the room here. These are the people that, that self-select, pay money to travel in a tough economy, and come and listen. You're the people that will change and, and either rescue this industry from the new generation or leverage it with the new transformational technologies and thinking. I, I will leave you with a couple of things. Don't expect any fi to find any silver bullets here. Um, you know, I don't know if there's a lot of hunters. You'll find some hollow points, right? Some high caliber <laughs> weapons, but don't expect to find any silver bullets. And I'll go back to my initial comment where I said this, leading this type of change is more like the Iditarod than a ballet. It's going to be hard work. It's going to be problem solving. But I, I think I speak for everybody on this stage when I tell you that, that we are here to help and those like us are here to help. So please uh, take full advantage of this. And thank you so much for the honor of allowing us to be here and, and do this.